Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again today, and uh, we always like to welcome our Oklahoma people from wherever they are. I don't think we have anybody from out of state today that I'm aware of, and uh, for those of you out in television, we just like to make you welcome as we feel that you're uh, inviting us right into your living room or kitchen or wherever. But uh, for those of you who may be new to our program, we are just totally independent. Nobody underwrites us. We do not hold to any one particular line. And uh, we keep it informal. And we just trust that you'll search the scriptures with us and uh, see what the Bible says. You know, I, I don't claim to have all the answers. I don't claim to be the only one that's right. But uh, hopefully we've been getting through to people that uh, they're seeing things in their Bible they never saw before. And we just give the Lord the credit for that. So today we're going to be able to start finally in the book of Hebrews. I just looked it up the other day and it was six years ago that we started with Paul's letter to the Romans. And over these last six years then we've been totally in Paul's epistles, finishing up with Timothy. And now we're going to go into which I think is also a, an epistle of Paul, although it is not directed to the Gentile or to the church, but it is directed to Jewish believers, Hebrews. And uh, there's, of course, always been a lot of controversy over this letter as to its authorship and as to its time of writing and so forth. And again, I'm not a theologian, see, so I don't have to get hung up on any of these big heavyweight arguments. I just tell it what I think it is, and that is that the Apostle Paul is definitely the author of the book of Hebrews, and I'll show you in a minute why I am quite adamant about that. Uh, secondly, I've always felt that it was probably one of his earlier letters, if not the earliest, and then I read something this past week that confirmed that, and that is that in some of the earliest, more ancient manuscripts of our New Testament, the book of Hebrews followed 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Now everyone has pretty much agreed that the Thessalonian letters were the first of Paul's writings. And so if Hebrews in the ancient manuscripts followed 2nd Thessalonians, then that falls right in with what I've always thought, that it is indeed one of his earliest letters. And uh, another thing I think we always have to realize now as we get into Hebrews, there is absolutely nothing of church language in the book of Hebrews. In other words, you won't find a Roman road to salvation in Hebrews. There is not a Hebrews road to salvation. And so you say, well, well then what's the theme of the book? Well, the theme of the book of Hebrews is twofold. Number one, we're showing a constant comparison of how this economy now under grace is so much better than anything that went before. And we'll be looking for that over and over throughout the book of Hebrews, that this is better. Yes, the law was good, but this is better. And then secondly, and more preeminently in, in the importance, is that Hebrews is going to point out who Jesus Christ really is, as God the Son. And we'll be emphasizing that as we go through the book. So those are some of the things that we want to use as an introduction to this tremendous letter to the Hebrews, that it is not a book of church doctrine. You won't find a single word in here about salvation based on Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. You don't see any reference to the body of Christ. You don't see any reference to faith plus nothing, as we see so often in Romans. Nor is it a book of uh, correction and admonition like the book of Galatians. And so it's just totally different. In fact, I'm going to compare this letter to the Hebrews with the Old Testament. And I'm going to treat it much the same way. And it is a book that just simply shows us, even as you remember when I taught the tabernacle, you remember what I always pointed out about the tabernacle, that everything back there in Exodus that describe the tabernacle, the gold, the silver, the brass, the wood, uh, the linen, and the purple, and the red, and the white, every jot and tittle of the tabernacle 
was a picture of one way or another of Jesus Christ. Well, the book of Hebrews is going to do the same thing. It's going to just show us what a tremendous, important personage Jesus Christ really is. And you remember over the years I've referred to a gentleman who came up to my ranch house one day and asked the question, who in the world is Jesus Christ? Well, Hebrews is going to point it out very clearly. All right, now I said in the beginning of my remarks that I was quite confident that the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the Hebrews, and I use a comment from Peter, 2 Peter chapter 3, because we have to do everything as much according to the book as we possibly can. Now, I had to tell someone on the phone again the other day that had a question about some of these things. I have, you have to remember, the Bible doesn't tell us everything we'd like to know. But it does tell us everything that we need to know. And so there are some areas where we just simply have to say, well, the Bible doesn't tell us, and let it go at that. But here I think we have ample proof from the pen of the Apostle Peter writing now just before he is martyred. So at the end of, yes, Paul's days as well as Peter's, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. I use them so often to emphasize Paul's apostleship. But now I'm going to use it to emphasize Paul's authorship of the letter to the Hebrews. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Where Paul write, or Peter writes, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. Now I guess I should stop there a moment and let's qualify who are the you that Peter is addressing. Well, come back to 1 Peter chapter 1. And there we see very plainly that Peter is writing to Jews, not Gentiles, not even a mix. He is writing to Jews of the dispersion. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, so on and so forth. So who is he addressing? Jews of the dispersion, who had already been scattered away from their home area of Jerusalem and Judea. All right, so now if you'll come back to 2 Peter 3 then, Peter is letting them know that these people to whom he is writing had received a letter from the Apostle Paul. And uh, I read again the other day, all the early church fathers never were aware of any other letter that Peter could have been alluding to. This is the only one. And uh, so I think it just makes all the proof in the world. All right, let's read it again. Account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, Jews. See that? Then you go into the next verse, if anyone is tempted, and there are scads of them out there who do not feel that Paul's writings belong in our Bible. I hear it constantly. But here is proof, even from the pen of the Apostle Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, like any other writer of Scripture, that Paul's letters are all Scripture. Read the next verse. Verse 16, as also in all his epistles. See how plain this is? That in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, that is, things pertaining to salvation, in which are some things hard to be understood. Even Peter, at his late date, had a hard time comprehending some of these doctrines of grace that had come from the Apostle Paul. But nevertheless, he is still agreeing that Paul's writings now, as you read on, that they who are unlearned and unstable twist, as they do also the other, what? Scriptures. Now, when you say the other scriptures, after talking about Paul, what does it make them all? Scripture. And so Paul's letters, by even the inspiration of Peter's pen, 
is still all Scripture. So if anyone ever tries to tell you, well, I don't think much of Paul, I don't think he belongs in our New Testament, you just take them right to these verses. This is as plain as it can get that Paul was just as much a writer of the Word of God as Moses or Isaiah or John or Peter or anyone else. All right, so back to Hebrews 1. We find then that this letter was most definitely written by the Apostle Paul, probably early on in his ministry. And the reason I say early on, I'm going to take you another one, honey. Romans 1, 16. Let's go to Romans 1, 16. And uh, then that'll, I think, confirm why I feel that this Hebrew letter had to be written even before many of his other epistles. Romans 1, 16. You all know it, I'm sure, but let's look at it and put it on the screen. Where Paul writes, Romans 1, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, the gospel, is the power. Now, I'm not going to come back to this verse, so remember the word power here, and I'm going to be referring to it before the afternoon is over. And so the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. And now what is the process? Jew first and then the Greek. Now, wouldn't it also make sense then that it would be the same order in his epistles that he's going to write an epistle to the Jews first and then to the Greeks? All right, so now when you come back to Hebrews chapter 1, we probably won't get further than the first word in this program. And what is the first word? God. God. G-O-D. God. Just exactly like we start Genesis. Well, let's go back to Genesis. Let's just compare Scripture with Scripture today. We're going to take our time and... Uh, this book of Hebrews may take us just about as long as the other epistles of Paul. I don't know. We'll, we'll just have to see. But uh, we're not going to go through it fast. But here in Genesis chapter 1, we have the same terminology. In the beginning, God. See that? All right, now, back here in Hebrews, of course, written in the Hebrew, this term God, and I think I'll put this on the board if I may, this term is Elohim. And Elohim in the Hebrew was a plural word. When used with a small e, it was translated gods with reference to the pagan gods. And it was a plural term. And so Elohim is not singular, it's plural. And so it gives rise, of course, to what we call the triune God. Now, I'm not going to use the word Trinity because the first thing, you know what people are going to write? Well, the word Trinity isn't in the Bible. Well, I know that. It's a coin term, and uh, it's just one that everybody understands, so I won't use it to satisfy those folks. But whatever. Elohim is a plural term for the triune Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. All right, I might as well put them over here on this side of the board then. I'm going to put it horizontal because otherwise the danger, if I put down like this, they're going to say, well, the Father is superior to the Son, the Son is superior to the Spirit. No, they aren't. They are all co-equal. And so we have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All equal in that term Elohim, that triune Godhead. Now then, this was all involved in creation. Absolutely it was. But when we get to the New Testament, we find that the second person of this triune Godhead, God the Son, steps out, if I may use that kind of terminology, and becomes then the Creator. And we've done this when we taught from Genesis, and I guess I better do it even when I teach from Hebrews. So here in Genesis 1.1, the triune God is reckoned as the creator. But now jump up to the New Testament and go to John's Gospel. <clears throat> John 
Now I know I've covered all this in previous programs, but uh, we always have to be aware that we've got new listeners coming in every day. And uh, for others who only heard it once, it never heard, hurts to hear it again. And so this triune God designated the work of creation to the communicator. And then we see that now in John's Gospel, chapter 1. John's Gospel, chapter 1. In the beginning was the what? Word. And what do you do with words? You communicate. That's the whole idea. That in the beginning there was a person of the Godhead that would communicate. He would express thought and things would happen. All right, read on. The Word was with God, right up here, in the triune Godhead. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was no less than the Father, no more than the Spirit. The three were co-equal in the Godhead, and the Word was God. Now verse 3. All things, everything, was made by him. Now, I'm a stickler for grammar, and I'm always showing what modifies what. Well, the verse here that all things were made by him is referring to the word up in verse 1. And so everything that was ever created was created by this person of the Godhead we call here the word. Now, to again confirm that this is speaking of Christ or Jesus as we know him in the gospel accounts, drop down to verse 14. And the Word, the communicator, this person of the Godhead, was made flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. Now, later on, if not this afternoon, it'll be in our next taping, we're going to look at this term, the only begotten. But right now, I'm just going to let it set for, so, for the time being. And so he is beheld as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's the word. All right, now as you come on over into Paul's writing then, you come to Ephesians, I guess would be the first one. Ephesians chapter 3, and we can drop right down to verse 9. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9, because I always like to have people see the scriptures all agree. They all fit. Ephesians 3, verse 9, where Paul writes to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, the triune again, but the same God who created all things by Jesus Christ. See how plain that is? Sure the Godhead was involved, all three of them, the Elohim of Genesis 1.1, but the Son steps out and speaks the Word and communicates to the nothing that was there, and out came creation of the universe. All right, now let's go over to Colossians, where Paul makes it even so much plainer. Colossians chapter 1, and we'll drop down to, oh, I guess I better just take the time. Let's come in at verse 12. Colossians chapter 1, and let's start at verse 12 so that we are sure that we know who we're talking about. And Paul writes, giving thanks unto the Father, who hath made us meet, or has prepared us to be partakers of the inheritance. Now we'll be looking at that word when we get into Hebrews. That we might be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who, speaking of God the Father, has delivered us from the power of darkness and has, past tense, translated us into the kingdom of his dear, what's the word? Son. Capital I. Now we're going we're to chase that word down. 
all the way from Genesis through Scripture, the word son after a while. But we'll let that lay for the moment as well. All right, now then, verse 14. In whom, that is in the Son, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sin. Now verse 15, here it comes to the part of creation. Who, speaking of the Son, is the image of the invisible God. See that? Now what does that mean? This triune God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit was never visible. It was an invisible spirit, and, and it operated in the invisible. But when the time came, it was God the Son who stepped out and became then the visible manifestation of all three. That's why in John 14, you remember when Philip said, Show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. What did Jesus say? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because Jesus was the manifestation of the invisible Godhead. All right, read on. So he is the image of the invisible God, the Father, the Spirit, and the, and the Son. He is the firstborn of every creature. In other words, he was before anything was ever created. He comes from eternity past. And then verse 16, for by him, by God the Son, the one who became visible, the one who was Jesus of Nazareth in his earthly ministry, by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, whether they be visible or whether they're the invisible spirit world, whether it's thrones, whether it's political power, or whether it is ecclesiastical powers, all the thrones and dominions and principalities and powers, you can't find anything in all of creation that was not created by the Son. Everything was created by and for Him. See that? Now then, verse 17, he is still the controlling power. Even after his work of the cross and having been risen from the dead, he is the all-powerful God. And by him then all things consist, which means held together. And so my, the world today, knows nothing of this. For the average citizen of this world, Jesus Christ is just a cuss word. He's just somebody to blaspheme. He's someone to ridicule. But oh, one day they're going to stand before him and they're going to drop to their immortal knees and they're going to recognize that he was indeed the creator of everything. Everything. Never lose sight of that. All right, then you could not even go on and even to the book of Revelation, and I, I won't bother with that. Even Revelation says that Jesus Christ was the creator of everything. And I can never emphasize that enough because so few people realize it. My, I've had people write and tell me they've been in church all their life. I've had men who have been Sunday school teachers for 20 years and they never knew that these verses were in their Bible. But here it is, just as plain as day, that he was the manifestation, the visible image of the invisible God. And when he appeared on earth, he never gave away any of his deity except the glory. And of course, he picked that up again at resurrection. But oh, listen. This is what makes our gospel head and shoulders above any religion in the whole wide world. There is not a religion on this planet that has the Creator God as their Savior and Redeemer as we have. See, that's why we can, we can express this with so much confidence. We're not putting our faith in some dead God. We're not putting our faith in some idol. 
We're not putting our faith in some far-flung philosophy. We're putting our faith in the visible manifestation of the invisible God. And one day we're going to see him face to face. And we're going to be with him, the scripture says, for all eternity. You know, I, I've made reference to this before. Isn't it amazing how the world will just gather by the millions to get just a glimpse of some famous world personality, whether he be a politician or a religious leader or an athlete or whatever. And they'll just about do anything just to get a little glimpse. And then they use this person as an object of ridicule. And they use the creator of everything as a cuss word. And it is so disheartening. But for those of us who believe, and we can see from the scriptures, from the word of God, that God the Son stepped out of the invisible Godhead and became then the communicator to whatever it took to bring all the things of the universe into being. And uh, I guess in the half a second or so that we've got left, we'll come back to Hebrews chapter 1 for just a few moments. Hebrews 1 again. And so this God, the same God of Genesis 1-1, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, at sundry times and in different manners, spoke in times past unto the fathers by the what? The prophets, the Old Testament. And so in our next program, we're, we're going to take a look at why Paul admonishes us to study the Old Testament. Just like the book of Hebrews. There's not a Roman road in the Old Testament. There's not a plan of salvation for us in the Old Testament. There's nothing of the gospel of grace in the Old Testament. But we study it. And we rest on it because it's the building blocks that God has laid down just like a, a secular education. My, I've, I've used the example over and over on this program. How far would a young person get if all of a sudden, without any previous education in grade school or high school, you plunk him down in a calculus class at the university? How long would he last? Not five minutes. He wouldn't even be able to understand the opening remarks of the professor. Why? Because he has not had a building block of education. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Felding Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.